Good evening. It's been a day of deep concern and speculation centred on Buckingham Palace after the Queen's entire staff was summoned to an emergency meeting. These are live pictures of the Royal Residence in central London. It was from here that rumours ricocheted around the world about the well-being of Prince Philip. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And what agony it was for monarchists last Thursday afternoon after Britain's Daily Mail published this exclusive about an emergency meeting at Buckingham Palace, supposedly called for 3 a.m. London time, which, as the deadline approached and Britain slept, set off a frenzy of rumour and speculation in Australia. Good afternoon. We'll start with the story that is gripping the world right now. First to growing speculation, the Buckingham Palace will make an announcement in the next few hours. And naturally, in their desperate desire to be first, the Twitterati were also fueling the flames, with even seasoned journalists like Paul Bongiorno adding to the fire. There has been a death at Buckingham Palace. World waits for an official announcement. So, who could it be? Was it the Queen, now 91, or her 95-year-old consort? French papers had supposedly reported it was the Duke of Edinburgh who had popped his clogs. And back in London, Britain's most popular paper, The Sun, prepared a sombre front page. Then, unaccountably, pressed the button to publish online. Prince Philip dead at 95. Whoops. Of course, he wasn't. A right royal cock-up. And by 2pm Sydney time, this was official, after a TVNZ reporter got through to the palace on the phone and was able to tweet... You could safely assume the Queen and Prince Philip are not dead, Buckingham Palace says amid reports of meeting. So, come the 6pm bulletins, we at least knew what it wasn't, even if we didn't know what it was. Good evening. There are more questions than answers tonight, but royal correspondents are dismissing wild speculation about the health of the Queen and Prince Philip after Buckingham Palace called an emergency meeting of its staff. After that, it was wait and see. And with Seven's countdown clock ticking towards the announcement, Nine's Tracy Grimshaw interrupted a current affair with exclusive breaking news. I am hearing that, uh, right, I, uh, sorry, what, I'm sorry. Okay, Michael, I am hearing that there is a royal announcement, there has been an announcement that the Queen is stepping down from public life. Which that and that is very significant. Now, um, have we got uh, someone is in my ear? Is have we got confirmation of that, or is that speculation? Just, we have confirmation. I think it's Prince. We have Philip. confirmation of a statement from the palace. Do you have it? Prince Philip is stepping down from public life. Yes. Well, I'm just reading that now. Whoops! Again, in the rush to be first, standing down. Prince Philip was asked, "I can no longer stand up." The 95-year-old replied. And next day, there were more jokes being made on his behalf. Keep calm and carry on. One is not dead. You're all dead wrong. One is simply retiring. But now to the real media news of the week, which involves trouble at Fairfax and the possible breakup of Australia's second largest newspaper group. Journalists at the Sydney Morning Herald and its sister newspapers across the country have called a snap week-long str uh, strike after Fairfax Media announced sweeping job losses. Yes, Fairfax is under the knife again as it faces its fourth bout of bloodletting in the last 10 years. Back in 2011, the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age and Fairfax's other metro papers could boast around 1,000 reporters, sub-editors and photographers. They now make do with around half that number. And 125 more jobs are now set to go to save the company $30 million, leaving staff shocked and appalled. The scale of these cuts proportionally is unprecedented in Fairfax history. Meanwhile, former Sunday Age columnist Jill Stark tweeted, There is simply no more fat to cut. These are not cost savings. This is a proud masthead being slowly killed by appalling management. In 2009, Fairfax took up six floors of the Age building. Now the entire staff is on one floor. Savage as the cuts may be, this is a crisis that besets the industry. Ten is about to slash its news operation, and Fairfax's biggest rival, News Corp, is also cutting staff to save $40 million, although with much less publicity or protest. As former Sydney Morning Herald editor Eric Beecher warned Media Watch viewers last year, the big city news sites are all facing potential disaster. They are heading towards the cliff and it's not their fault, but they are heading towards the cliff really fast. I think that cliff is, for everybody, is 
within a year or two or less. So, what is the problem? Well, one thing it's not is lack of an audience. Fairfax organisation has more readers than ever. Mm. It is at a record high. The appetite for the work that comes out of Fairfax has never been stronger. What's gone wrong here is the disappearance of classified advertising. And mm. the internet destroys old advertising models. Remarkably, Fairfax's big city papers are still profitable. But revenue is falling at around 10% a year because print ads are still declining and digital ads can't fill the gap since they bring one-tenth or maybe even one-hundredth of the revenue per ad. Worse still, Google and Facebook are cleaning up. In 2015, they increased Australian revenues by $1 billion, while local news sites lost $700 million. And last week, Facebook announced its ad revenue worldwide grew another 51% last year. But is the answer to cut to the bone, as Fairfax is doing yet again? Many say it is not. The product of Fairfax is journalism, and they are sacking journalists by the hundred. They are clearing the shelves. It is a recipe for disaster, for if a publishing company cannot offer journalistic quality, it has nothing to offer. You can't keep cutting the core of the business because soon there will be no business left. Not surprisingly, Fairfax journalists agree. But Fairfax CEO Greg Highwood says cuts are essential to secure the future of the big city mastheads. What we are doing is that we are making sure that our publications are profitable. And by profitable, that means sustainable. If they are not profitable, they become vulnerable. Seriously vulnerable. It's hard to argue with that. But it's worth noting that Fairfax top executives are not sharing the pain. In fact, they are set to gain. Greg Highwood, Corporate Counsel Gail Hambly and CFO David Housego have, between them, been awarded 48 million share options in the last three years, worth around $14 million. And as Fairfax's share price rises, more millions come their way. Maserati driving Highwood recently cashed in some of his for $5.4 million and picked up a bonus of $2.5 million, which could employ 16 journalists for a year. So he and his team have an incentive to cut, as former Fairfax business editor Michael West told the ABC. You've got the journalists and you've got management, and their um, situations are entirely at loggerheads because management want the share price to go up so their, so their share options rise and they become more wealthy. So what does the future hold? Well, Highwood said only three months ago that Fairfax will always need great journalism to drive traffic to real estate site domain and other new businesses that are growing or more profitable. I mean, we wouldn't have those very large audiences unless we put out fabulous journalism. So it is a virtuous loop here we're talking about the great journalism providing the great audiences and those audiences being instrumental in driving new businesses. Those words sound a little hollow today. And even if there is no more bloodletting at The Age, Herald and Fin Review, they will face more pressure on staff, less time to write and research, and most likely more mistakes, like this shocker from The Herald's Friday front page. Meanwhile, some important stories from the arts, courts, councils, health and science will likely not get covered. And that is not all. I think we will see the company broken up. I think the, uh, the institutional investors see value in the parts more than they see value in the whole. And what happens to the mastheads after that is, is really the question which interests me much and which, most and which I think is of most concern for democracy. Over the weekend, Fairfax received a 2.5 billion takeover bid from a Texas hedge fund that would indeed break up the company. TPG wants to keep Domain and the big city mastheads together, which could help keep them safe, but it plans to cut the regional papers and radio stations adrift. We doubt shareholders will approve, not least because it values Domain at around a quarter of its rival, REA, which is owned by News Corp. I just think this is a pretty awful deal all round. The takeover would also need Foreign Investment Review Board approval, and there would be plenty of people in Canberra lobbying against that. What is Fairfax management thinking? These are strong brands. Can anyone explain why a TPG fire sale of Fairfax is in national interest? Deal or no deal, the job cuts will go ahead and the problem will still remain. After 25 years of the internet, no one has yet found a way to make news pay like it used to. But now, let's go to America, where the media is also waging war 
but with the president, whose first 100 days were marked with the release of this triumphant ad. Companies investing in American jobs again. America becoming more energy independent. Regulations that kill American jobs eliminated. The biggest tax cut plan in history. You wouldn't know it from watching the news. And right on cue, the media he hates hit back, with CBS, ABC, NBC and CNN all refusing to show it because of the accusations it contained. The mainstream media is not fake news and therefore the ad is false. And that made the war flare up again, with Donald Trump's website boasting the ad had scored 1.5 million views in 24 hours and adding... It really shows that the American people will not sit idly by and let the mainstream media act as a puppet master. So, how has the media covered Trump in his first few months of office? According to the conservative-leading Media Research Centre, Donald Trump... ...has received by far the most hostile press treatment of any incoming American president, with the broadcast networks punishing him with coverage that has been 89% negative. And an earlier study of the news on NBC, CBS and Fox, combined audience more than 20 million, reached a similar conclusion. A mere 3% of reports about President Donald Trump that aired on NBC and CBS Nightly News were positive. Remarkably, there was even bias against Trump on that conservative bastion, Fox News, owned and controlled by Rupert Murdoch, who last week welcomed his good mate, the President, to the stage. The Commander-in-Chief and the President of the United States my friend Donald J. Trump. Yes, even Fox was negative about the president and his achievements twice as often as it was positive. And why might that be? Well, factcheck.org has what it reckons is the answer. 100 days of whoppers. Donald Trump, whom we crowned the king of whoppers when he was a long shot candidate in 2015, has held true to form during his first 100 days as president of the United States. No surprise then, with relations like this, that the President did what none has ever done before and boycotted the annual White House Correspondents' Dinner. Or that the night's headline act, Muslim comedian Hassan Minaj from the satirical Daily Show, pulled no punches in his speech. We are here to talk about the truth. It is 2017 and we are living in the golden age of lying. Now's the time to be a liar, and Donald Trump is liar-in-chief. And remember, you guys are public enemy number one. So, where was the president? Out in the Rust Belt with the faithful, giving the media his now familiar assessment of them. Let's rate the media's 100 days. Should we do that? Should we do it? Because, as you know, they are a disgrace. According to a morning consult poll, more than half of Americans say the media is out of touch with everyday Americans, and they've proven that. Meanwhile, back at the correspondence dinner, Hassan Minaj was acknowledging that, or at least accepting, that none of the jokes the media made about Trump or the lies they exposed seemed to make any difference. It has left zero impact. <laughs> it, it's true. Supporters of President Trump trust him. And I know journalists, you guys, are definitely trying to do good work. I just think that a lot of people don't trust you right now. And can you blame them? Ouch. But while President Trump's supporters clearly don't trust the mainstream media, there's plenty of Americans who are convinced The Washington Post, New York Times and others are not only needed more than ever, but are worth paying for. New York Times CEO thanks Trump for boosting subscription growth. The New York Times said it added 308,000 new digital subscribers during the latest quarter, around 600,000 new digital subscribers in the last six months. And is that a passport to the Times' future? Well, no. It's better than nothing. But just like poor old Fairfax and News Corp in Australia, the Times' advertising revenue is still falling. As we said, there are no magic answers. And you can read more about tonight's stories on our Facebook page or our website, where you can get a transcript and download the program. You can also catch up with us on iView and contact me or MediaWatch on Twitter. And don't miss Media Bytes every Thursday on Facebook, Twitter and our website and also on iView. But for now, until next week, that's all from us. Goodbye.